Detective Recap here. Today, I'm going to explain the ultimate revenge movie that shows vengeance both at its grittiest and pettiest. This is about a thriller mystery film called, Nocturnal Animals. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. In a busy art gallery, large and naked women are dancing on LCD screens, with some of them sprawled face down on white tables. After the exhibit, the lonesome gallery owner, Susan Morrow, looks on with a solemn gaze. The following day, Susan's in her grand home when she receives a package. It contains a manuscript titled Nocturnal Animals, along with a note from her ex-husband, Edward. According to the note, the book is different from anything he's written when they were still together as she gave him the inspiration he needed to write from the heart. Now, he wants her to be the first person to read it. Closing the note off, he wrote that he'll be in LA until Wednesday. In the kitchen, she shares a stiff conversation with her current husband, Hutton. He asks about the package, then comments that she and Edward haven't spoken in 20 years. Even without the subject of ex-husbands coming up, Susan and Hutton act more like roommates than a married couple. Hutton doesn't bother kissing her or even approaching her. Instead, he goes on with preparing his drink. After noting how sad it was that Edward didn't remarry, Susan subtly admits that she was upset that Edward didn't come by her opening in the gallery. When she asks if he wants to go to the beach with her, Hutton just gives her a blank look before explaining that he has to fly to New York. Hutton wants to close a deal there since he doesn't want to sell any more of their properties. Susan offhandedly mentions that she doesn't really care about their art, but Hutton curtly replies that he cares, and selling them is pissing him off. Still maintaining her composure, Susan tells him that she can fill their walls with new LA artists, so people won't realize they're going broke. That way, he wouldn't have to be embarrassed. The two may look like models, but they're far from being the model couple. Their interactions are stiff and awkward, and Hutton's more concerned with keeping up appearances than he is about his wife. He doesn't even try to make it up to her. With her cold and avoidant husband, Susan's marriage is just as bankrupt as they are. At night, Susan settles in bed so she can finally read the manuscript that's explicitly dedicated to her. She imagines every detail, and the novel begins with family man Tony Hastings going on a West Texas road trip with his beloved wife, Laura, and their feisty daughter, India. But things take a sharp turn at night when they get tailed by two cars on the empty road. Eventually, one of the cars overtakes Tony's, keeping him from passing. In his stress and worry, Tony accidentally hits the car in front of them. Of course, the driver curses at him, demanding him to pull over, but Tony keeps driving. The other men won't relent, one of the cars keeps ramming into Tony's until he's forced to stop at the shoulder of the road. One of the three men steps outside the car, and he motions for Tony to roll his window down. The rugged man, Ray, casually greets Tony and asks why he didn't stop after hitting their car. Think about the cockiest guy you know, and imagine someone ten times worse than him. He acts like God's gift to the devil, and he's the kind of guy who'd tell said devil, I'm not stuck here with you, you're stuck here with me. One of Ray's cronies mentions that Tony has a flat tire, and Ray slyly comments that it must be from when Tony tried shoving them off the road. When India whispers to Tony that they're lying, Ray almost loses it. After loudly asking if she's calling him a liar, Ray tells Tony to drive. He realizes that they're not lying, so Ray sweetly offers to fix their tire from them. Unfortunately, Tony can't fix a tire, so the family's forced to get out of the car. Ray then calls Tony over to show him the damage he did to his vehicle. Throughout their exchange, it becomes clear who the strong and weak are between the two of them. While Tony stays meek and polite, Ray keeps getting pissed at him over his car and how uppity his family is. Tony even stays apologetic despite everything being Ray's fault. With India constantly defending her father, Ray starts focusing on her. But India eventually manages to break free, and Laura goes to comfort her. As Tony slowly approaches his family, Ray keeps taunting him, asking if Laura's the boss and crudely emasculating him. When Ray gets down on the pavement to hump it, Tony finally snaps, screaming at him to stay away. With Tony and Ray now shouting at each other, Laura runs to the car, yelling at India and Tony to go. Just as India manages to get in, Ray's men rush inside the car, too. Everything goes quiet for Tony, and he stands there, paralyzed until his daughter's piercing scream breaks him out of his trance. The car is driving away, and the remaining goon, Lou, restrains him. Suddenly, Susan closes the manuscript. She's disturbed and horrified by what she just read, so she takes her phone to call Hutton to ask him how he's doing. But during the call, she realizes that there's another woman with Hutton. After some seconds of silence, Susan quietly tells him to get some sleep. That night, Susan and Tony aren't that much different from each other. Just as Tony had helplessly watched his family get stolen from him, Susan can only sit there, unable to do anything but face the reality that she is losing her husband, too. Though Tony's having his life ruined by three thugs who spawned out of the dark underbelly of Texas, Susan's life is already miserable. And neither of them can fight against it. Back in Nocturnal Animals, Lou coldly forces Tony to drive Ray's car. They pass by a trailer along the way, and Tony thinks that his car is parked there, but Lou says it isn't. He keeps driving until they reach the end of the dirt road. Indifferent, Lou sarcastically wonders if he made a mistake before yanking Tony out of the car. Lou immediately drives away, leaving Tony to desperately try and catch up to him. After tripping and falling, Tony finally starts crying. Some time passes, and Tony's still wandering along the clearing. But when he notices a car approaching, he quickly hides in a dried-up arroyo. The car stops, and Ray and Lou step out, with Ray asking what he left Tony there for. Lou calls for Tony, telling him that his wife wants him, but Tony wills himself to stay hidden. It doesn't take long until they get back inside the car and drive off. 
Morning comes, and after a long and grueling time of walking, Tony manages to report the incident to an officer. He then stays in a motel, where he broods and worries in the bathroom until he breaks down, sobbing. Like Tony, Susan is distraught, perturbed, and unable to sleep. She's as heartbroken as Tony is over what happened both in her life and in the story. But unlike Tony, she doesn't cry or pour her feelings out. Susan just has that ever sad look in her eyes. Sometime later, Tony receives a call from a lieutenant, informing him that they found his car, but there are no signs of his wife and daughter. Outside the motel, Tony meets the hard-boiled Lieutenant Bobby Andes, who tells him that they'll drive him around so he can backtrack. Still dazed, Tony says he'll try. Together with Andes, Tony retraces his steps, all the way back to the dirt road. Tony stops dead in his tracks when he sees a red sofa in the garbage dump. There, his wife and his daughter lie on their sides, naked and unmoving, with India's back turned to them. Stunned, Tony slowly gets down on his knees while Andes gently turns Laura's head, showing her lifeless, bloody face. With a tear-stained cheek, Tony helplessly asks if she's alright, and Andes doesn't answer him. Susan has to stop reading. In a subtle panic, she quickly calls her daughter on the phone just to listen to her voice. Like India, Susan's daughter lies naked on her side on a bed with red covers. Though the tragedy is what compels Susan to call her daughter, the parallels between nocturnal animals and her life aren't lost on her. Like her and her daughter, Laura and India are both redheads. Laura even wears the same gold cross that Susan herself has. Susan remains distraught even after the brief call, and she starts thinking back to a distant memory. It was snowing when she came across Edward in New York. Through her memory, it's revealed that she's been visualizing Tony as a scruffier version of her ex-husband. Susan asked what he was doing there, and smiling, Edward told her that he was applying for a Columbia scholarship. This surprised Susan since she expected him to be at the University of Texas. The two of them caught up over dinner. They got to talking about Susan's overbearing mother, and Edward mentioned that her mother always had such sad eyes, just like Susan. However, Susan didn't appreciate the comparison. The topic shifts, and Susan mentioned that she's too cynical to be an artist while Edward believed that she's underestimating herself. With how pragmatic Susan is compared to the more sentimental Edward, the two were opposites in their own right. But to Susan, that didn't matter. All she could see was that he had the strength to believe in her when she couldn't believe in herself. Eventually, Susan coyly asked him to come home with her, and he made a joke about her being too forward for a Texas debutante. They shared a laugh. Back to the present, Susan is lying in bed, still troubled as her thoughts drift back to nocturnal animals. Tony's in the police station, looking tormented while Andes explains Laura and India's injuries. Worst of all, the two were violated, and the news makes Tony sob. Andes feels bad for him, but he continues with his report. Ray had taken the women to a trailer they broke into, and this trailer can be a promising new lead for them. Still lying in bed, Susan thinks back to another memory, this time of her affluently dressed mother, Anne. She was berating Susan for her decision to leave New York and move to Austin. Tense, Susan expressed her plans of marrying Edward, but Anne was against it. She reasoned that Susan's too strong-willed for someone as weak as Edward. While Anne acknowledged that Edward's sweet and romantic, he didn't have money, drive, or ambition. And even if Susan didn't care about the finer things in life now, and guaranteed that she'd be seeking them later. She saw that Edward was fragile, and she knew that Susan will only hurt him in the end since the things she loved about him now will be the things she'll hate about him in the future. With a knowing look, and commented that she and Susan were a lot more alike than Susan thought, and when she vehemently denied this, and warningly told her to wait since every girl eventually turns into her mother. Decades later, Susan still has her mother's sad eyes. Day by day, she lives a hollow existence unloved by her husband and unmoved by the art and the luxury she surrounds herself with. It's only now after reading Edward's manuscript that she finally feels something more than her unhappiness. She's haunted, devastated, and in awe, so Susan lets Edward know about this through an email, where she even offers to meet him on Tuesday evening. Back in Nocturnal Animals, Tony receives an email from Andes, which contains an image of a man. Soon, Andes calls him, asking him if he recognizes the man whose name is Steve Adams. Pained, Tony admits he doesn't, frustrating Andes since he's the only lead they have. One night, Tony has a horrific nightmare of his daughter being violated. As she screams and struggles, the man suddenly turns to look straight at Tony with a wicked smile. This jolts him awake. Later, Tony calls Andes to inform him that he's sure that Steve Adams is one of the men. A year passes, and a clean-shaven Tony heads to the police station, where Andes is smoking outside. Andes tells him about an attempted holdup at the supermarket, and there, one of the guys got killed, one escaped, and one was caught by them. After instructing Tony to see if he recognizes the guy they caught, he says that the one who got killed was Steve Adams. Inside the station, Andes has the different suspects lined up. Tony easily recognizes Lou, so Andes sends everyone else away. As kind as he is to Tony, Andes can still strike the fear of God even in men like Lou. He knows how to rough them up without ever raising his voice or drawing his gun out. His unwaveringly casual yet hardened demeanor is enough. Andes coolly intimidates him, making the man tense and afraid. Finally, Andes asks about Ray and Steve, and when Lou asks, who? Andes calmly mocks him, asking if he's an owl, before making him leave. With him gone, Andes reports that they can charge Lou with murder since he had his prints all over the trailer. Smiling reassuringly, he tells Tony that he'll keep looking for Ray. At his core, Andes is just a man who seeks justice in the world just like Tony does. But the difference is, Andes actively takes on the role of a protector. 
Too kind for his own good, Tony can't act by himself, so Andes encourages him and even acts on his behalf. At Susan's office, she remains distracted, even as her assistant, Alex, reminds her of an upcoming meeting. Alex observes that Susan didn't get any sleep, and Susan confirms this, adding that her ex-husband used to call her a nocturnal animal. She explains that she did love him and that he was a writer, but she didn't have faith in him. And in a panic, she left him for Hutton. That night, Susan is still alone in her lonely house, and she thinks back to nocturnal animals again. There, Tony and Andas stop along a deserted road. After exiting the car, Andas has a brief coughing fit, but he assures Tony that he's okay before continuing to smoke. They stand by some scruffy trees and from there, they can see a mobile home with a toilet installed on the deck, which a naked Ray is sitting on while happily talking on the phone. With Tony confirming that he's their guy, the two go on to approach Ray, and his smile drops as he demands them to get off his property. He settles down a bit when Anda shows him his badge then invites him over to the station for some questioning. Unlike Lou, Ray shows no fear. His cool insistence that he doesn't know Tony is flawless. But sometimes, the haughty way he looks down at a broken up Tony betrays the truth. Soon, they arrive at the trailer where Ray and his buddies took Tony's family too. Anda shoves him inside, assuming that he violated the women on the bed. With Ray denying ever violating anybody, Tony suddenly speaks. He's crying, his voice trembling while he demands to know what Ray did to them. Ray looks condescending, and he stays quiet while Tony finally screams about wanting to know how they felt and wanting to know if they hurt. Unmoved, Ray smirks smugly at Tony, who suddenly punches his face. Susan drops the manuscript when she got to that part, and she thinks back to another memory. A nervous Edward asked her for her opinion of his manuscript, and while sitting on a red sofa, Susan gently suggested that he write about something outside of himself. Though Edward always encouraged her whenever she'd claim that she can't be an artist, Susan didn't extend the same support. Instead, she told Edward that he could take a break from writing since he was starting to think that he didn't have a book in him. This had Edward defensive, and he started rambling about how Susan made him feel like she didn't believe in him, especially when she'd tell him to go back to school. In turn, Susan defended herself. She asserted that she's just being realistic and asked if all he wanted to do was work at a bookstore while writing his novel. When Edward stopped pacing to stare at her, she quickly added that it was romantic, but she asked if that was it. Edward cut her off, quietly telling her that she sounded like her mother, offending her. In another memory, Susan remembers dropping her pen and Hutton picking it up for her. Returning to nocturnal animals, a disappointed Andas calls Tony to let him know that the authorities are letting Ray go since they don't have enough hard evidence. Later, the two are at a diner, and Tony's eyes are bloodshot as he speaks with Andas. He quickly mentions his lung cancer before talking about how Ray's lawyer made a deal with the DA. While Andas talks on about the case, Tony keeps trying to interject about how he never told him about the cancer, but Andas keeps focusing on discussing the case. Ever since the two met, Andas showed no interest in anything else but helping Tony, who came to him wrecked and undone, find justice. And this still rings true, even with Andas's proverbial clock ticking. Finally, Tony gets him to stop for a second to ask about Andas's family. After Tony encourages him to eat, Andas asks Tony, off the record, what he wants him to do with Ray. Tony asks him what he can do, and Andas confidently says anything he'd like. He firmly asserts that he's got nothing to lose, and he's not letting that crap DA screw up his last case, nor is he letting another murderer go free. Overwhelmed, Susan takes another break from reading the manuscript, and another memory comes to her. While they're walking along the streets, Susan started talking about how she and Edward weren't right for each other and how she needed a life and a future with more structure. Though Edward tried reassuring her, Susan admitted that she's unhappy. Edward stopped, and as Susan started telling him he's sensitive and romantic, he cut her off, saying that she thought he's weak like she's already told him before. For all of Susan's insistence that she will never be like her mother, her conversation with Edward was beginning to sound like a repeat of her mother's own warning. Susan started wanting more in life, and there was no longer a place for Edward's tame and unambitious sensibilities there. Susan kept firmly repeating that she never said he's weak, and Edward cut her off again, asking if she loved him. Though she insisted that that wasn't the point, she relented and answered that she did love him. Unsatisfied, Edward responded that when you love someone, you work it out and be careful with it, otherwise, you might never get it again. Tearful, Susan confessed that she couldn't do this with him anymore, and she continued walking away. Returning to nocturnal animals, Andas forcefully takes a cuffed Ray to his house. He kicks him to the bed and makes him sit up before aiming a gun at him. However, Andas starts feeling sick, so he gives the gun to Tony while he throws up. Meanwhile, Tony doesn't even look like he's held a gun before, and Ray laughs at their sorry display. Had it been any other vengeful man in front of him, Ray would be liable to getting shot between his eyes. No ifs or buts, this cocky son of a gun would have gone down. But instead, it's just Tony, still Tony. Upon returning, Andas spits on Ray's face. A sheriff then comes in to shove Lou inside, so Andas takes the gun from Tony and shoves Lou to the bed. Despite the two's protests, Andas roughs them up and intimidates them. With Lou looking like he's ready to break, Andas pulls him up, and he antagonizes him with his gun until Lou starts apologizing repeatedly. After patronizing him some more, Andas turns him to Tony and hands him the gun. He then removes Lou's handcuffs before grabbing Ray to remove his, too. Now, Andas has both Lou and Ray at the end of Tony's gun. But Tony remains unsure and nervous despite Andas' encouragement. After a year of seeking justice, Tony is finally face to face again with the two men who ruined his life. But Tony hasn't changed. 
He's still the same mild and sensitive man from the dark highway who can't find it in himself to hurt anyone. Suddenly, Anda starts coughing, and he quickly runs off to throw up again. Tony's still unable to do anything, so Ray and Lou bolt out of the house. Andas returns immediately, and after taking his gun back from Tony, they give chase. He manages to shoot Lou down while Ray escapes. Wheezing, Andas weakly approaches Lou, and without listening to his pleas, Andas shoots him. This startles Tony, as well as Susan in the real world. She starts thinking back to another time in her past. After being in a medical clinic, Susan's in a car with Hutton. She started crying and talking about how she didn't even believe in abortions. Devastated, Susan said that she'll never be able to look at Edward after what she did to his child, to which Hutton assured her that he'll never find out. With Hutton's arms wrapped around her, Susan realized that Edward was watching them from outside the car. In that moment, Edward was just like Tony. Like him, a car was where Edward would last see his family. And from that point on, Edward had to live without his wife and his child. In Nocturnal Animals, Tony breaks into sobs before shouting that he's glad that Anda shot Lou. Now on his knees, he starts blaming himself for everything that happened. Gently, Andas holds his shoulder, promising Tony that he's okay. After making Tony look at him, he sincerely tells him that he's a good man. With Tony calming down, Andas instructs him to go to the trailer to see if Ray's there, while he will go to the highway to check there. Then, he gives Tony his own gun. Concerned, Tony asks if Andas is in trouble for all this, and Andas retorts that he doesn't care, he's dying. It was tragic, definitely, to put vengeance in the hands of a dying man with nothing to lose. But clinging to vigilante justice may be the only way Tony will know peace. After all, nobody ever gave him the chance to make things right, nobody but Andas. Soon, Tony arrives at the trailer. He enters quietly, and upon hearing him, Ray jolts in bed. Tony silently aims his gun at him, while Ray tries to sound casual as he asks for Tony's cop friends. Tony admits that it's just him there for the moment, so Ray immediately relaxes, clearly not scared of him and the gun he doesn't know how to use. But Ray lays off on the mocking when Tony blankly threatens to kill him. After Tony calls Ray a killer, he coldly retorts that his wife and kid had it coming. Serious now, Ray says that what happened was an accident. He has a certain pride in how people talk to him, and if they go around accusing him, he's not putting up with it. Accusations give him the right. If his daughter thought he was going to violate her, then he's going to violate her. To this, Tony keeps weakly repeating that nobody gets away with what they did to his family, so Ray calls his bluff, telling Tony to kill him. Smirking, Ray muses about how fun it is to kill people, getting Tony riled up. Here, it becomes even clearer what kind of man Ray is. He could keep saying that he killed Laura and India out of his own twisted sense of pride, but his reasons were and will always be much simpler than that, he's a sick man who loves having power over people. With growing anger, Tony orders Ray to get up, and Ray complies with an unfazed grin and a fire poker behind his back. Sauntering towards Tony, he smugly says that he remembers killing and screwing his wife, while Tony's too weak to do anything about it. Suddenly, Tony fires his first shot, then his second one, which hits Ray in the chest. Cursing him, Ray swings the fire poker at Tony. The next day comes, and there are flies all over Tony's body. He regains consciousness, but Tony can't see the light of the day. With his clawed and bloodied eyes, Tony's blind now. After getting his gun, he weakly gets up and walks until his foot hits Ray's dead body. He reaches over to feel the corpse before continuing to walk outside. It must have been clear to Tony that it was Ray's body he touched, but he doesn't even spend a second to relish in his vengeance. In spite of everything he's been through, Tony isn't the kind of man who would revel in hurting others, no matter who they may be. While Ray got to torment him, all Tony had on Ray was one shot that missed and another shot that killed him. Blindly staggering towards the road, Tony raises his arm. He shoots his gun in an attempt to alert Andas, but this makes him fall over. As he tries getting up, he falls again and onto the gun. It goes off in his stomach, and Tony's accidentally shot himself. Helpless and alone, Tony's heart soon stops beating. Being the nocturnal animal she is, Susan is experiencing another somber and sleepless night when she receives an email. Upon checking it, she sees that it's from Edward, who tells her to let him know when and where to meet. Time passes, and a hopeful Susan is waiting for Edward in a restaurant. She waits and waits until she's one of the last few people there. At this point, she realizes that Edward is never showing up. Tony's vengeance upon Ray has all the makings of a gritty classic. Everyone involved in the murder of his wife and daughter had died, and the ringleader who kept berating him for his weakness died by his hand. And as for Edward, Tony's revenge is his revenge because Tony's story is his story, too. Against Susan's criticism, Edward made a story that was so about himself, all while deeply moving her. Laura in India represented the family and the happiness that Edward lost. Andas represented everything that Edward should have been and the part of himself that kept seeking justice or vengeance. Ray may be Susan, the person who took everything from Edward. Like Ray to Tony, she was the person who made Edward feel like he's weak, and because he's weak, he lost everything he loved. And now that he had blood on his hands, Tony had to die, along with the good and weak man everyone thought he was. Most importantly, nocturnal animals became the sole connection that Susan had to better days in her past. It gave her, a deeply miserable woman, hope and escape. If she didn't find happiness in amassing her fortune, surrounding herself with art, and being married to Hutton, then perhaps meeting Edward again would bring some joy back into her life. But Edward never showed up. If Tony's vengeance against Ray was physical, Edward's vengeance against Susan was everything else. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. 
and leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.